So, uh, thank you very much, oh. Oh. Yes, very much. <laughs> I'm very happy to present Frank Tarker today, who is a professor of theoretical physics at the Imperial College uh, of London. She did a PhD under the supervision of Stephen Hawking at the University of Cambridge, had postdoc positions at Fermilab, UC Santa Barbara, uh, Caltech, was a lecturer at uh, Queen Mary uh, University, London before moving to Imperial. She works obviously on quantum gravity and on quantum set theory, as we will hear more today. Uh, she's one of the main contributors to that uh, field, and uh, she's published a large number of articles. I'm not even trying to, uh, to give you a sense of all, all the work she's done. Uh, many of them go often with her many graduate students. Uh, she's trained over the years. Uh, in causal set theory and related approaches. And uh, so I'm very, very happy and honored to welcome you today to Geneva. And uh, she will be talking about being and becoming a causal manager. Please. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. I'm very happy to be able to address uh, this community of philosophers and physicists. And I think when I first heard about your project, I was very enthusiastic. Um, obviously, because I felt that we all know that Einstein was both a great philosopher and a great scientist. Perhaps none of us could really hope to encompass within our subconscious <laughs> both being such a great scientist, physicist, and being both a great philosopher. But for me, as a community, of philosophers and physicists, um, we can sit at the end. So a significant progress on fundamental questions together. So it's wonderful to have the community that you have on the project that you're pursuing. So wish you all success. So it's great to be here. So I'm going to talk about something that I've talked about um, on a few occasions before, and I feel that I've failed to really communicate what I'm wanted to communicate. So I'm going to try to say something slightly different from what I've said before. Um, and my subject is the dichotomy between being and becoming, which is one of the what I might call, what I might call ancient dichotomies. So here are a couple of other ones. So these arise in our struggles to understand the nature of our world, and they have been part of that exploration since we have records of people you out from what our world is like. Um, so being versus becoming is the world, does the world just exist in a timeless way, or is there, um, do things actually happen? Does the world become? Um, another dichotomy is object, objectivity versus subjectivity. I don't know exactly how one wants to say that, but um, our description of the world, or can we aspire to a description of the world which is truly objective, um, or does subjectivity necessarily enter into the game because we are of course part of the world? Um, and then the final dichotomy that I was going to play a part in the talk today is um, the dichotomy between discrete, uh, discreteness and continuity. So it's the world fundamentally. On a continuum, or is it fundamentally discrete? So these things, I'm going to, the, the talk is mainly kind of on the first dichotomy, but the other two will, will come into it as you can see. So there is a long standing and persistent lack of consensus on this dichotomy of being versus becoming, and it takes different forms. One form that it takes is disagreement between whether our experience of the passage of time is illusion or not an illusion. So here's just an example of someone, this theoretical physicist called Davies, who's an expert in quantum field theory and space spacetime, in some interview with FQXI, which is on their website. Um, so he says, the flow of time is an illusion. I don't know there are many scientists and philosophers who disagree with that, but because. And presumably the explanation of this illusion has something to do, has to do with something up here in your head Memory, I guess, and they've got memories and stuff. So it's a feeling we have that it's not a property of time itself. Time doesn't flow, it's a feeling of psychology. 
involved in physics. Here's another. Um, uh, the opposing view, uh, time really, this is uh, John Norton's paper, nice paper, time really passes. Time really passes. Our sense of passages are largely passive experience of fact about the way time truly is objectively. In fact, the passage obtains independently of us. Time will continue to pass for the smoldering ruins where we are all sentient things and even are suddenly to be snuffed out. We have no good grounds for dismissing the passage of time as an illusion. It is none of the marks of an illusion, rather, it is all the marks of an objective process whose existence is independent of the existence. So, it's long standing, consistent, uh, ever since we have records of people thinking about such things, they're maybe uh, they basically take opposite points of view to uh, opposing points of view. There's no consensus, but it does seem, as if Paul Davis is right, the majority of you amongst philosophers and science and physicists is that the universe is a block, so coming down on the side of being rather than becoming. A block in which past, present, and future events all have the same status, they are equal physical status. And to my mind, the arguments for the block are strongest when they're grounded in our best current science. I'm going to say that, that means generalizability. I'm going to say more on that in a minute. The arguments for the past of time is real are composed of appeals to infinite experience, which just doesn't feel like that. It doesn't feel like delusion, it feels like it's really passive. And as such, they are subjective. This is subjective evidence, it's not quantitative. But nevertheless, these um, these experiences are, are very powerful. Nothing is more fundamental to our experience of the world than its temporal nature. And hence, the, um, the lack of consensus persists. Okay. So, I'm going to go through the arguments for the blocking that I want to view from our best physics, which is general relativity. But then let's just take a step back from that for a minute and think about physics. Relativity, which is the Newtonian view of space and time. So, pre relativistic physics, time was lost in the sense that it became spatialized. It was modeled, it is modeled in Newtonian physics as nearly another dimension. I think it's just a picture of space time in Newtonian physics. Each these slices is just R3, three-dimensional Euclidean space. And we can stack the PS three-dimensional Euclidean space at time t equals zero, PS three-dimensional Euclidean space at time t equals one, and time t equals two, time t equals three. You can stack them up in a continuum. So the, lab the time labels, I've just chosen them to be for the sweet ones here, but time will take continuous values. So we have to fill in between these slices all the all the three-dimensional Euclidean spaces that fill out and a four-dimensional block and four-dimensional space time. And so you can see that in this picture, if you just think about this now as uh, this four-dimensional thing, time has lost its somehow that in some sense it's lost its special character and has become just another dimension, just like dimension. And the picture looks like another dimension like dimension. So of course it isn't quite lost because there is indeed a difference between the geometry of space and the geometry of time, in the sense that if you consider, let's say, consider um, the trajectory, the world, so-called world line of some object, let's say, a dust grain or, or galaxy, at time t equals zero, it's here, at time t equals one, it's here, in between it, it moves, it traces out this world line, returning in space time, red here. Um, that pierces these these three-dimensional spaces at these point, these red points in the this, Along this world line, time that elapses along that world line is just the difference in the time of this slice and the time of this slice, the time of this three-dimensional space and this three-dimensional space. So in that case, it's, it's just three units of time. And that has absolutely nothing to do with um, has no interaction with um, the distance that is moved by this dust ray or galaxy in space. So to work that out, you take this world line, you project it down onto one of the three-dimensional space spatial slices. Let's say this one. You just project down that line, and you work out the length of that line 
in Euclidean three dimensional Euclidean geometry using the three dimensional Euclidean metric. And that's the distance that is moved in space. And these are two completely independent things. The geometry of space time in Newtonian, Newtonian physics distinguishes between space and time. And, uh, they are separated. So in Minkowski space, time becomes unspatialized. So uh, a crucial, some kind of uh, intuitive aspect of time is recovered in the sense that time becomes local. So I've again drawn space time in this Minkowski space time as if there are three dimensional spatial slices. And there's, a and there's a time label for each of the slices, just as before. But now we are to think in the Cosby space time, we must think of this time label as just a label, it's just a coordinate. It doesn't, have, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with physical time, physical time that you actually measure using your watch, your watch the clock. So, indeed, time now. Is not, it's not the case that for something that starts here, goes on its trajectory through space time and ends up here, that the time that it takes, that we measure on a clock that it carries along with it, would be three units of time. That is just not the case. So, um, indeed, on this, on this trajectory that I'm drawing, it wouldn't be three units of time. Um, it, would be, um, it would be less than that. And the, indeed, the time that it that elapses along two different world lines that start and end at the same place in space time. It would be completely different depending on which trajectory um, is followed. So the time that elapses along the red world line and the time that elapses along the green world line, they would be different. And they in general are, they're just different. We don't notice those differences in everyday life because the, um, the, um, the accelerations that you would have to undergo in order to achieve world lines that differ Measurable amounts of time are, um, are too great for us to achieve in everyday life. So, in special relativity, physical time is what's called proper time. It elapses locally along world lines. There's no global time anymore. And in this sense, relativity undoes the spatialization of time. Time is not just another dimension. There is local time that elapses along each and every world line in the space time. And then in general relativity, it's a generalization of special relativity. Space time is again a four dimensional entity, and it is now curved. There is, uh, described by the mathematics of differential geometry, which is curvature. So I've sort of illustrated this just um, with a, a sort of curvy looking block. I've again drawn, just to guide your eyes, some slices. So here's a, this is supposed to be three dimensional, this slice is slice, so there's this green one, the pink one, the blue one. Um, again, in general relativity, time is proper time along world lines, there's no global time. We can label these slices with time a time coordinate, and say this is t equals zero, this is t equals one, this is t equals two, this is t equals three, but that time coordinate has nothing to do with physical time. And now, in special relativity, there were special kinds of foliation um, which are also known as inertial frames. But in general relativity, even though they're not, so in general relativity, there are no physical foliations in space like high surfaces, or no deferred foliations in space like high surfaces. There is, and I've redrawn this diagram like this, just with the bunch of taking away those, those slices now, so that they were just to guide your eye. Now we have to do without them, but there's no such thing as physical three dimensional space. There's only space time, four dimensional space time. Time again is what elapses, it's proper time that elapses along world, world lines. So here's my world line. I start here, let's say I'm born here, I end up there, I die there, this is my world line, my trajectory through space time. And everything and everyone in the universe has its own trajectory through, um, through space and time. There are also fields, I can have some fields in space time. Um, and all Altogether, this is the world in general. And I've drawn here on here uh, a, a special thing, which is the thing light code. So if you think about this event on 
my world that I write there, the light cone in, in so this past, this is the future, so this cone up here is called the, uh, the future light cone. The place that I could go from this event here in space time are all inside this future light cone. The events in my past that could have influenced me at this point here are all inside the past light cone. And the events which are outside both the past and future light cone are causally disconnected from me right here. They are events that can either influence me here, and nor can I influence them from here. So this light cone structure exists at every point in space time, and it's called the causal structure or the causal order of the space time. It's some information that uh, when you know what the geometry of the space time is, you can read off from it what the causal structure, the causal order is of the events in space time. Are there any questions? Okay, so in general relativity, this is the block universe view. That the world, the physical world, is a four-dimensional space-time with world lines, fields um, in it, events in it. From the very beginning of the universe, if it had a beginning, but all the way to the very end of the universe, if it will have an end, it all exists in this four-dimensional block. Events like um, my birth and my death, and my trajectory through my world life through space-time are all there in the block. The um, trajectory of a photon, for example, that's produced in some supernova um, is also there in the block. Um, here's someone else's world line is there in the block. Um, they um, emit a photon that goes off. So everything, every event, past, present, and future is there in this block. Um, block universe um, picture in diversity. And, uh, oh, so here I'm using these words that um, Jerry Butterfield introduced me to. Uh, they are due to um, theorem, I think, according to Jerry. So, uh, so a block head is someone who believes in a block, a broad head is someone who believes in the kind. Uh, after seeing the philosophers in the world. So the block head says, oh, Look, events happen in the block. The block describes things happening. Here we have, you know, a, a girl is walking the dog, here we have a tree which is growing, here we have a supernova exploding. All of those things happening are there in the block. So the block corresponds to, is, it does correspond to things happening. And the broad head says, no, no, that's not right. But the block is static, right? It just is. It corresponds to events having happened. Right, so here we've even got the end of the universe, right? So the whole universe has run its course, and everything that, that has happened or will have happened is there. But then it just describes events having happened. They have happened, and here they are. That some of the events, some of the events which are in our future, from our perspective here, they will have happened. But the block describes, shows them having happened. It doesn't show them happening. And then the block head says, no, it does correspond to if that's happening. The broadest says, no, it doesn't. No, yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, no. And it's a debate that goes nowhere. It's a debate I have. <laughs> it just doesn't get anywhere. So I hope that what I'm going to show, uh, show you today is a way of actually making progress with this today. To, so the debate can be a bit more fruitful than just this, yes, just no, just an exchange. So, to do justice to the temporal nature of our perception whilst maintaining the four-dimensional nature of the physical world of general relativity. So general relativity says you can't split space and time up into, into three-dimensional spaces in all the time. That general relativity denies that. It says there's no such thing as three-dimensional space. There's just four-dimensional space and time. A growing block seems to be what is called for. This is associated with broad. Um, and the broad head. It, that tends to call for a process of becoming, a space time becoming, in which the past is real and fixed, concrete, 
and the future is yet to be, and it's always tempting to quote this quatrain um, from the Rubai at Bokhaya, uh, since it's, it sort of it poetically describes this feeling that we very strongly have that the past is happened, it's fixed, it's real. Uh, the moving finger writes and having written moves on, or all your piety and your wit shall lure it back to cancel half the line, or all your tears wash out and are worth it. Okay, so a growing block, that seems to be what's called. We need to do justice to the four dimensional nature of the world in GR. Um, but here's a way not to do the growing block. Okay, so now I have an agent that works with my keynote, you know, I think doesn't work with the PDF. So, so you have to imagine that I've got a blanket. So, so I take my blanket. So I take this, it's not going to work because it projects onto the coat. Okay. <laughs> so you have to imagine that I'm covering up, I'm covering up <laughs> the block and I'm just pulling back this, uh, this, this blanket uh, and, and I'm revealing, <laughs> revealing like the block as I go. So the idea is that that's, you know, the, the universe doesn't exist all at once like this, it grows. So it starts with starts with nothing. And there's a little bit of it, and a bit more, and a bit more, and a bit more. So it grows. There's some dynamical growth going on. And it's not really an unveiling of some things and some out there. Right, yes. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. It's not so, there at all. It's not there at all. Right. It's not there at all when you, yeah, before it. Right, right. But, yeah, just to, to illustrate it, it, it looks like you're. Okay. Yes. Exactly. So it's not. It's not supposed to be unveiling something that's already there. It really does grow. Yes, yeah. But that's wrong. That growing by taking a sort of piece of paper or something and just doodling it upwards, that's wrong because the trailing edge of the of the uh, of the block, the, the 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 future boundary, if you like, of the block, that is a physical global three-dimensional space of simultaneity. So all of those, all of the events, all of the things that happen on that, on that, in that three-dimensional space, they're all simultaneous. And so this, this process, this growth process, people also call it hypersurface becoming. This growth process adds to the physics a physical process which gives a preferred Foliation. It's foliation that you're using in order to, uh, to model the growth. So any process of becoming, in order to be consistent with, to do justice to the um, lack of simultaneity, of any notion of global simultaneity, can't just be this thing where you just have you have a block which, which grows and there's a, there's a future hypersurface. And this has led many physicists to believe that a physical passage of time is just incompatible with relativity. It, it, there's no alternative, people argue, that what must exist, all past, present, future events must be there. They have to be there in the world all at once. And therefore, our experience of passage of time is just an illusion. I think this is probably the last life statement that Paul Davis So, this has been challenged. And it's been challenged by Raphael Sorkin. And he challenges it with a counterexample. And it's that counterexample I want to show you. And it's a counterexample from causal step theory, which is a discrete approach to the problem of multiple gravity. So the, the, there are many approaches to the problem of multiple gravity. This is one in which the idea is that space, the space time we experience, which seems space on general density is just an approximation to a speed, an underlying discrete structure which is uh, more, uh, more fundamental. So why discreteness? Well it's most works in quantum gravity believe that the smooth differential map of structure in space time that we have in depth in general activity will break down at the smaller scales, the so-called Planck scale. Um, and that's what kind of short distance cut off will come into play. And perhaps 
the absolute simplest kind of vanilla flavored um, proposal that we can make to realize this idea that space time just doesn't, just doesn't have any structure on scales one from the other is that space time should be atomic. That space time is made of discrete, indivisible, and uh, space time atoms, if you like. So, space time discreteness is a very simple sort of, you can, and there are all sorts of other ideas, you know, maybe there's something like fractal or that dimension, maybe uh, space time is replaced by a different description in terms of d0 grains in the left dimension. There are other ideas around, but I think the simplest thing is just that space time just doesn't have any structure that scales on the flat scale, and it's, it's because of the space time is discrete. Um, and the, because of the, the heuristic back of the envelope argument about um, where quantum gravity effects should come into play, and also the value of the black hole entropy, which is something I'll um, discuss with you. Afterwards. The expectation is that there'll be one space time atom per Planck volume, four dimensional hypercube, four dimensional hypercube of Planckian volume. That's the, the scale at which the atomicity um, comes into play. So uh, note this discreteness that's being proposed in, that I'm proposing now is a space time discreteness, it's not a spatial discreteness. So it's, if you like, let's go back to this. Here. Okay. So the atoms are, you can, so let's just envision them as being um, described or portrayed as just dots like these red dots just scattered around in the, um, scattered throughout the space time. And so they're things like that rather than you know, an atom like the usual particles that we're used to would be that what corresponds to an atom in space time is a whole world line. So the atoms of space time are not world lines, they are they are um, they correspond their idealized events which, uh, which are localized in space time. So it's a space time discrete, it's not a spatial discrete. Okay. And because of the scale at the Planck scale, that means that if you take the observable universe that is um, you can go out to the whole horizon and just uh, back of the envelope calculations of the space time volume of the observable universe, then it's roughly 200, uh, 10 to the 240 in Planck units. It's actually a useful number to remember. Right, if you can remember the Planck time and the Planck length, then knowing this is really useful because this is a four dimensional volume. So if you take its, you know, its fourth root, which is 10 to the 60, that's the age of the universe and Planck units. So if you remember that the Planck time is 10 to the minus 42 seconds, and work out you know, the age of the universe. So it's, it's a useful number. Okay. So the idea is that, that space time is fundamentally discrete, actually, um, and our continuous space time is just an approximation to that. But then the question is, what can what structure can bind these? I and mean, if you just had a bunch of atoms then in a bag, then you know, they're just like structures, just they don't have any, in, there's no information there that can, that can encode the geometrical information in space time. So they need some structure. What can, what could it be? What could the structure of these atoms, what properties could these atoms have so that they could actually be the thing that underpins a whole curved Lorentzian space time. I mentioned this term Lorentzian just means that it has this light construction. That's a, 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 it's just a, a name for a, for a geometry which has this, has this light curve or causal structure. So I mentioned causal structure, and that's a proposed answer to what kind of what kind of structure we should um, give, what kind of structure we should uh, use these space time atoms should have in order that they can encode geometrical. So first of all, space-time in general relativity has a causal order. I've alluded to this before, um, and that causal order is given by the light cones. So here I've labeled some events A, B, C, and D. So D is say the production of a photon in a supernova. 
um, A is so the um, observation of that photon in some, some, um, some detector in some experiment on Earth. Um, along the world line of some scientist, here's another event later on uh, along the world line of the scientist. C is just some other event in the, in the, uh, in the future of this one. Um, and so space time in GR has a causal structure because of course we don't know which events can cause the influence which other events. And the hypothesis is that the space time atoms in this discrete underpinning to, um, to continuum space time should have a causal order. And that's the structure that will that's rich enough to give us back the um, uh, approximately the continuum geometry of the generator. So the hypothesis is that continuous space time is an approximation to a discrete partial order or causal set. So I've just drawn a very simple causal set here. It's got um, five elements. And the and it's represented here as, as a graph. So the elements are the, are the vertices of the graph. And these edges between them, they represent the order relation. So we say that this element D Proceeds and there's a direction on that, a direction on the edge. We say D precedes A, or um, is before A. A precedes B, or is before B. D precedes C. Um, but A and C are unrelated. So that's the um, analog in the discrete structure for two events being causally unrelated in the um, continuous space. So nothing that happens. C can influence or be influenced by that A. So that's represented here by them not having an order in the order relation. So another way mathematically to describe what a causal set is is that it's a transitive directed acyclic graph. Acyclic means there are no cycles, there are no closed loops that you can go around in the, um, in the causal set such that you always follow the direction of the arrow and come back to yourself, so it's acyclic. It's directed, that just means that each, each edge has, has an arrow. And it's transitive, which means that D is before A and A is before B means that D is before B. And so it, the, the relation, this causal order, is, um, is catching. And, so, um, and that, again, mirrors what is the case in ordinary Space time and relativity. So if D is to the full, if D can influence A and A can influence B, then D can influence B. So if it, the, the, this, this relation, this order relation is transitive. So this is a causal set. And there's a convention about drawing causal sets, um, which is that you can dispense with the arrows on the edges, they're there, but you, can just, you don't need to draw them if you always conform to the convention. That an upward going edge um, goes from an earlier atom to a later one. So the 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 ordering of past to future is the is the uh, the one that we're used to in relativity. So if you just always go on the page, these um, conventional upward going edge means that the arrow is on the top. Um, then you can just get rid of the arrows, and then it looks like that. And this, this is what's called a Hasse diagram for a finite partially ordered set or post set. So, are there any questions about what an ordered set is? Okay, so causal sets arise from the child or children <laughs> of a marriage between. Causal order and elasticity. The elements of a causal set are supposed to be the atoms of space time, and continuous space time is proposed to be an approximation to this discrete underlying reality. So, just the idea is that that's the air in this room at a large scale of a fluid description, described as a continuum of quantities like a um, like the um, like the density, but really, you know, it's made of molecules, and it's really just it's really discrete 
So the idea is that continuous space time and GR is just an approximation to what's really going on and what's really going on is discrete. Um, and the, can say that um, the observable universe is described by Hilton's set as 10 to 240 elements. So this bio level set in no way gives you any indication of the structure, that the, 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 the huge amount of information that would be that you would need to describe the observable. So, let us just, for the sake of this talk, assume what I call the kinematical emergence of space time and causal sets. Because basically, the proposal that I just made is true at a kinematical level. What that means is that if I want to describe the space time, our space time, then there is a causal set that doesn't drop. Or if I want to describe the space time uh, of um, two colliding black holes, then there is a causal set that does the job. So that a causal, a causal set can contain all the geometrical information of the Lorentzian space time on scales larger than the discrete scale. So that what appears to us to be a smooth continuum is actually just an approximation to, uh, to a discrete other uh, underpinning. I have got time to justify this to you or give you um, the evidence that we have that this is the case. I'm just going to mention one thing though, because hopefully we can discuss a bit, this a bit more um, tomorrow, the, which is a theorem which is something that it exists in the continuum. So it's a, a theorem about Lorentzian geometry. Um, and the theorem which was built up from the contributions of many people um, is that if you have a Lorentzian space time and you know its causal order, that means you have to imagine that you just have a list of all of the elements in space time and you know which of the elements are causally related to which other ones, then you can deduce. Oh, and you know how much space, four dimensional space time volume in any region, then you can, from that information, get back the whole geometry. Okay. So, why is that evidence for this kinematical emergence conjecture? Well, because we all we have the causal order, that's the, that's the, um, the fundamental structure that the causal set has, so we have this causal order between these uh, space time atoms. So the idea is that that furnishes the continuum of causal order. And then how do we get space time volume? Well, we just count. We just count how many causal set elements we have. And that's the space time volume in action. So the causal set is it's potentially rich enough to give, um, to give us approximately a Lorentzian space time. We have other evidence, more, sort of, uh, more constructive evidence dynamic this kinematical emergence um, holds. Okay. Now to claim that GR emerges from quantum gravity, these causal sets which are approximatable by the Lorentzian space time, um, which are further solutions in the Einstein equation, they must arise dynamically in the fundamental theory. So it's not enough that you just have as a basis of your theory these causal sets which have nice continuum space times so approximation to them. You have to have dynamic, you have to have dynamical laws in your theory which will give you nice continuum approximatable space times which satisfy Isaac equations from the fundamental level. And we don't have a full theory. Um, it's of the quality of the big um, it's a frontier, a major frontier in, the, um, in our work on this, uh, on this proposal. But we, what we do have is a family of classical stochastic dynamics for causal sets. So it's not quantum, but it's classically stochastic. And here, the, the, um, the notion of becoming or growth, the growth of growing long a, a heuristic role in the development of, these, of this family of the classical stochastic dynamics. 
to furnish generally brief but not going into any detail about what, what these um, dynamics are. So they're called classical sequential growth models that you took David Bright out and my husband. And each classical sequential growth model is a random process, so there's certain probabilities, um, a random process of continual births of space time atoms. The space time grows into the future, a sort of sense of a growing block that we saw before, by the accretion of new space time atoms. So here is just one run, partial run, of one of these um, sequential growth models. So, so first of all, there's nothing. And then one space time atom is born, and then another one. And the stochasticity comes in because this space time atom that the, the one that I lived with one, can choose to be in the future of this one or not. So there's a probability for it to be in the future of it, to have a relation, so to have an edge, there's a probability for that, and there's a probability for it not to have an edge. So in one run, it just chooses one or the other, but it's, it's stochastic, which one chooses, um, it's random. But, so in this particular run that I've shown you, it chooses not to be related to the first one. And then another one is born. This one could be, again, unrelated to these, or it could be, could be to the future of them both, probabilities for those choices. And it chooses to be above the atom to be to the future of the atom, so zero. So for each of these steps, there is a range of different possibilities for the, the newly born atom. It can attach itself to the already existing causal set in different ways. It's probability distribution for that, and that's very it's concrete in these models. Um, and the causal set grows like this. So the third one attaches itself in that way. The fourth one decides to be above, to be to the future of both two and three, but not one. Like this. Okay, that's it. So it's a 10 element causal set. It's grown. And, however, that same cause, so the idea in causal set theory is that it's the structure, the causal structure of this causal set without being laid, without the, with no labels, which is the real physical thing, that the, the, the labels are, they are like the time coordinates that we put on space, time, and relativity. They have no actual, no, no physical element. They're not physically important, they're not, they don't have any physical state, they're just labels. So they're just convenient labels that we've got here. So I could grow the same causal step in a different way. So I could run the process again, and I could grow the same causal step, but in a different order. So the labels that the causal step inherit because of the order in which they grow are different. So in order to do justice to the fact that there's no global, so this would, if these labels were physical, that would be a global time, right? It would be, we would say, ah, oh, yes, this one happens before that one. That, that birth event two happens before the birth of three. But in the causal set itself, two and three are unrelated to each other. There is no sense in which one comes before the other in the, in the causal set itself. So physically, it can't be, it can't make any, it, it's meaningless to say that two comes before three, it's born before three. And this is, um, this is realized in classical symmetric growth models, in each classical symmetric growth model, by the prop, in the following way, the probability of growing this causal set this way is equal to the probability of growing it that way. So the physics does not distinguish between those two ways of growing. So the, 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 there's no physical way, there's no physical distinction between, between this and this. So it's only, the only the physical order of the birth of the atoms is the partial order in the resulting causal set. And all the other label information say here is pure gauge. So it is physically the case that this atom is born before this one because it is ordered in that way in the causal set itself. 
but it is physically meaningless. There's no physical sense in which this atom is born before that one. The fact that I've labeled that two and that three, that's, that's a gauge choice. I can choose this, well, I don't choose it, but I, I can, you know, this could be three and that could be two. So I could choose the labels in the little form. That's just gauge. It has no, has no physical meaning. So Raphael Salvi has called this this process asynchronous becoming. So it's becoming. The process is real. The call the causal set atoms, the space on atoms are being born, they're coming into being. But they're doing it in an asynchronized way. It, 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 so it, just what I said, the, the two atoms labeled two and three don't come into being in any in any order, they, they are unordered. There's no, there's no meaning to which order they're born. Okay, so here's the, so this is my attempt at a new way of, of talking about this model, so you can tell me whether it works. So, so I want to claim that in a CSG model, a bigger principle sequential growth model, there are two types of thing, two types of physical thing. And they're very different and they're just different in kind. So one of the types of thing are is the includes the space-time atoms and their causal relations. So they're they're what space-time is made of. But the other type of Physically, a physical thing in the theory is not anything to do with the atoms or relations. So it's the process itself, and that is also physically real. Or just physical, let me just say physical, I'm trying to purge myself of the word real. It's also physical. Ooh. No, I said real, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Alright. I did? Oh! Yeah. I'm not doing very well now. Okay. So, now, what corresponds in this model to things happening is the process, the birth process. Once an event has happened, in other words, the atoms that comprise that event have been formed, then those atoms are real. They exist, they're all physical, they form part of the world, and we tended to call that world, that part of the world, the past. That's it. So there are two different sorts of things, and they are both real, and they're both, they're both physical, and they're both part of the theory. There are space time atoms and their relations, and there is the process. The birth process is physical. Now, there is, there's a price to pay for this in, in declaring that the, physical, that the process, the birth process is real, there's a price. And the price is that there is no God's eye view of the world. The birth process is physical and objective, but the world as it is, the world that exists or the physical, it's subjective. Because if I want to say what what, what are the what are the atoms that exist, the the the, the uh, they are all the atoms that correspond to the events of my family. But that's personal to me. There is no sense in which there is we can say that there is a world now. Because there's no, there is no global now in this model. So it, it, you, simply, you simply cannot have a God's eye view of the atoms and their relations that are real. Even one that's changing, right? That just, it, it, you can't have that view. It's not, it, I can't, you can't draw it, you can't, you can't, um, you can't depict it. It's, um, it's necessary that you allow or you um, accommodate the linear world 
of view, a subject, a certain subjective. Alright, so, so let's see, so the, the conversation I claim that we had before that was so fruitless is now more fruitful, I hope. Okay, so, so the block head says the same thing, events happen in the block, look, there's a girl walking the dog, there's a tree growing, there's a sweeping over its body, brought us to know, the block static corresponds to events having happened, what's been happening, the block doesn't know, it corresponds to something that's happened. Now the broad head has a, has a new thing to say now. Which is compare the block, just this this whole bunch of space time atoms and their relations from the very beginning of the universe to the very end of the universe, all of that, just compare that, which you claim things happen in, with a CSG model, in which there are not just space time atoms, but the birth process as well. And it is this birth process that corresponds to happening. And that is missing in the block. The CSG model is dynamic, dynamical, it's dynamic. Things are happening. If these space atoms are being born, they're coming into being. And that's, you don't have that in the block. The block is just the block. You just have all these atoms and their relations, that's it. So, the broad heads are concrete to have their arguments upon. It's a theory to compare to the block. See, without that theory to compare to the block, you're on very weak ground. You just have to say, well, Feel like that thing. But now we've got something that could potentially be some uh, part of physics of the future, something like it, and it has something new to offer. In a CSG model, an event corresponds to a collection of space time atoms with causal relations between them. But the occurrence of that event, the happening of that event, corresponds to the birth of these atoms. And the birth of the atoms is not the same thing as the atoms. Abstract of the birth of the baby is not baby. So the birth of the atom is not the atom. Something different. Well, a different type of thing, but it is in a CSG model physical. So it's it's physical in the theory and it's a novel concept introduced to physics by Roger Adams. Okay, so let me summarize. So general relativity, I think, mean, is the strongest argument the block of universal point of view. It sets up a challenge to the claim that passage of time is physical because it tells us that the physical world is four dimensional, and that there's no such thing as a global physical world of now, um, and it means that you can't, if you can't realize the notion of becoming by a hypersurface becoming, and so many things have concluded that the universe just must block because you trust general relativity, the universe is a block. So the, I claim the future, future physics, future developments of quantum gravity may, may change this. And Zorkin's hypothesis that space time is granular and atomic over time scales, it introduces new possibilities for physics. These discrete models in which space time grows. And the birth of new space time atoms in these models is a novel concept. And okay, so let me come back now to the three levels. Where, where do we stand now in terms of those three levels? So, so I claim that in a CSG model, there's both being and becoming. So there is the past. For me, it's real. All those atoms and, and relations, they, they, they are events that have happened. It's, it's real. It's real. It's real. It's real. It is that, that my past. But there is also becoming the process. So there's being the cause. And becoming, which is the process. So we don't fit in, we can, we don't have to pump the one or the other in a CSG model like both. Okay, what about objectivity and subjectivity? Well, again, the physical world in a CSG model is both, or the, our description of the physical world, our, our picture of the physical world is both objective and subjective. The birth process is an objective process. It happens whether or not we are there. Or to, to witness anything at all, you know, the smoldering ruins, uh, 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 John Norman's um, description. Indeed, the process which you know is real will continue, whether we are there or not. So the process is objective, but the physical world is also subjective. 
because the causal set is subject. You can't say this is the causal set because there's no, there's no sense that it's subjective. It's subjective. It depends on the course for each space mass from the thought. There is a course, there is a past. All the, all the um, atoms and their relations with each other, that there is a past of this newborn hell. Those are real. They exist. But it's subjective to that. Um, it depends on that space mass. It's different for me, it's different for you. There's no God's like you. Okay, and then finally, what about the discrete continuum moment? So, as things stand now, I see no way to synthesize the two opposing hypotheses. And in that, it seems that there's evidence that I spoke felt the same way. This is some letter he wrote, I don't know who this is actually, ages um, in 1954, I said that he thought that the, this dichotomy is, is really a it's a choice from Parker. The, the alternative continuum or discontinuum is a genuine alternative. I.e., there, can, there is no compromise in. Um, in a discontinuum theory, there cannot be space and time, only numbers. It will be especially difficult to elicit something like a spatio temporal quasi algorithm for such a schema. It, unless you put it in the beginning, of course. Right? So, um, this is nice because you, think, well, you may not have. They find it difficult to imagine how you get such a thing from a discrete thing that you put in quasi, quasi uh, semi spatial temporal quasi order in the beginning, in other words, make your, make your, your fundamental entities called sets, then it, there you can start. I cannot picture to myself how the axiomatic framework of such a physics would look, but I hope it was altogether possible for development of the lead there. So that's the first time. I'll end there. Thanks for listening. So we changed the setup here so you can see the audience in Chicago. Do you, do you have a question, Chicago, to start? Yeah, I have two points, or kind of questions or clarifications, right? So um, this idea that the, the, the becoming of the individual dots is an objective process, or, or not objective, or a real process, um, and, and not just gauge, seems very much like an add-on. Uh, in the sense that it, it could one could as well have this kind of causal set picture with uh, more or less of a block picture. I kind of understood that. I, I can understand, understand that there are two different options here. But can the way of uh, favoring this kind of genuine becoming be... Can more arguments for favoring that option be given? So that was the first thing, and then the other, sh should, should we take that one first and then the other, or should I mention both questions first? Okay, good. So, um, well, there's the what? appeal to experience, oh. which is the appeal to experience. So I claim that we have, we have, we have evidence, observational evidence for, for this process being physical, which is that we experience it. So that's, I mean, that it's subjective. It's not something, I mean, once it's subjective, and of course, once one communicates it to someone, then it becomes, you know, it's then recorded, it becomes part of the past, it's, you know, so it's slippery. So, but I do claim that it, we have, we have observation, we have okay. direct observation elements for it. So, so it's basically so taking. So it's basically taking that kind of phenomenal experience seriously and taking that as a good argument for preferring this option over the other. I take it seriously. I mean, it, it depends on... So uh, let me say, I take it seriously and other people may or may not. That's okay. But I take it seriously. But the that's second thing is that hmm. it's, it, the, we are still using the notion of becoming as a heuristic for building 
dynamics of causal sets, so in particular, quantum dynamics. So um, these sequential growth models, they're classically stochastic. And we don't think, I think, we don't think that they, the causal sets that we have growth in them will be anything like our, our universe. So growing a piece of, like, we have no evidence that we can grow a piece of causal space time mm. in one of these classical sequential growth models. So we need, we need to do better, we need more realistic, more quantum um, models for, um, for causal sets, and we are at the moment focusing on models in which, indeed, the physical world, in a quantum sense, grows. So it's, and I think, yeah, in the end, I think if that sort of, um, Heuristic is is successful in producing a successful theory of quantum gravity, which is verified by in which we make predictions, quantitative predictions, which are then verified. I think there will be a strong case that this you know the, the something the something fundamental about that heuristic. But that's for the future. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So okay, but good. Thanks. Uh, the the other little kind of separate question was the the thing that when you discussed objective subjective and no god type point view i was slightly confused by that because i would say isn't there a god type point view in this becoming view but it isn't the static god type point view of everything the god type point view is the one that can actually see the becomings while the individuals within the causal set they are kind of blind to that to see them, you have to see them in time. That's the, um, because they don't occur in time. Yeah. Because if you think about you know, the, 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 they call it the atom label 2 and the atom label 3, if you imagine seeing them coming into being, then, then you would have to... Well, the way I imagine it is that they come into being in an order, but that order is not physical. So, so there's no... The, yeah, the physical a synchronicity of this process makes it it, it it means that you can't you can't have a view an overview of the process. No, no, it's, I it's not, no observer can have that. But since since the becoming is described as real, metaphysically real in a sense, wouldn't the god side point view be not like for an individual within the causal set? We cannot see that because it's different. But since you're give, giving the becoming process uh, a metaphysical or physical reality or what, how we want to describe it, then wouldn't, I, I think the God side point of view would be to see that. And I thought that was compo compatible with, or rather that. <laughs> yeah, okay. If you think about God as being sort of like us, you know, no, I'm not. I'm not thinking of God as being like kind of the point. There's no external point. I think there just is no external point of view where you see the causal set that is at any stage. That, 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 there's no such. No, no. I'm, I don't mean to actively kind of see it visually or experience it. But the God side point of view, when that expression is used, is typically to. To just describe the the underlying reality rather than as some kind of observation, kind of a figure of sp speech, okay. right? So, Maybe, so, so, yeah. so, so there's no there's no demigod's point of view. Yeah. There is a god's point of view. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's n that's not what I mean either. <laughs> it's, okay, now, let's drop this. It might be just kind of a whatever, but. Let's uh, follow up uh, on Kezo's first question. Uh, um, so I will say that in, in general philosophy, so you know that there is a field called metaphysics of time, and people try to uh, have some models of time. And so there we also find the growing growth series, not in the framework of the causal set theory, but uh, in, in the way of, of God, that you refer to. But in general philosophy, the growing growth Theory is a very uh, unpopular view, uh, and it's 
so much that uh, it would be a lot better if we could find the cosmos and theory, which is uh, which does not posit some becoming. Why? Because uh, there are many reasons to think that um, a very abstract description in the term of the growing world theory uh, will commit us to uh, many things. For instance, we will need two times. We will need the time within the block to, to describe uh, the temporal or spatial temporal organization of the block, but also another time to record uh, the growing of the block itself. And in the same way, we will need two concepts concepts of change. Change within the block as a difference between parts of the block as a change of the world itself, of the, of the spatial, uh, of the whole four-dimensional block growing. And so, I guess, um, and there is also, for instance, the skeptic argument. How do you know that you are at the edge of being? Because if the past is as real as the present, well, from his point of view, I mean, uh, Newton is present over there in the past. But how do you know that we, us in this room, we are not also in the objective past, having the false belief that we are already, that we are uh, objectively present, present when we are not objectively present. So there are many conceptual issues with the growing block theory. And so, um, I mean, for a general philosopher, uh, I think. The natural um, approach would be to be skeptic about the about becoming. And we also say that becoming was some kind of, we want to have becoming because of phenological consideration. But in fact, we, we never have phenological access to the past, only to the present. So it seems a bit weird to say that with, with your intuitions, you can gain something about the reality of the past. But it depends, so, on, yeah. depends on your physical model, I think. That's the thing. I think what your what your experiences are evidence for depends on your model. And that's the thing. I, I think it's very useful to have a physical model on which to hang your arms. At least I couldn't imagine making doing philosophy <laughs> in the absence of the world picture. So, 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 the model only suggest uh, the reality of becoming, or is it also consistent with the uh, uh, block universe view? I mean, can we describe the, the organization of the causal sets without introducing an objective becoming in the picture? I mean, you can do the following thing. You can run the process forever, create a block, and say that's what that is what the world corresponds to. If you do that, and the, and the theory is successful in the standard way, which this theory won't be because it's only a toy box, but if it really were quantum gravity, you know, then it would be successful in the standard way that is, you would, it, it would be, it would, it would agree with our experimental data because yes, and, 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 and all the scientific evidence that we have, that we have gathered, because that experimental data is, is written down, it's in the past, right? so it corresponds to space to space time accidents and their relations. So that would be there. What we don't get in it, I claim, right, is any explanation of why we experience things happen. Things don't happen. It's as if you know, it's it, the that block is the universe. In its universe, its whole history. That's that's it. That's there's nothing happening anymore. It's done. Done. Nothing. Like that. So I don't think that we need to have this becoming to account for our phenomena that things are happening. Um, it's like a good our experience at all. It seems to me that it's not. And we, we have the, the feeling, the impression that uh, uh, there is some continuity that is moving, but it's, it's a collection of discrete a sequence of photographs. But we have the feeling that it's moving. It's, no. Why is that? Because my experience is just not that sort of thing. Uh, anyway, the, the thing is, I, because the, you know, the, I mean, 
appealing to a subjective experience. It's very difficult. It's not hard to fix it, so I can't prove one way or another that we need this. But there is there is a physical there is a physical process which is something that you can you can it's there in the physics and if you choose to you can coordinate conscious experience if you don't have to. I mean it's there, it's a possibility, it's a new possibility. And tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that you know philosophy of consciousness struggles, and it struggles with explaining from a block point of view or a point of view in which they're just things, just things, right? to, to account for our conscious experience. Well, here's something new right? to, to, to coordinate with conscious experience. You may reject it, but, that, yeah, but it's something new to consider. It, it, it adds that there's something novel here, which is worth considering. And then, let me just go back to it. So you said that you need two things, two types of time. But there are two things here. There are two types of real things. There is, for example, time as pro in proper time along world lines in the causal set. So you can, there is an analog of world lines in the causal set. It's just time like world lines is just a chain of space time absolutes which are related. And Proper time along that chain could can be just the number of, of causal elements in the chain. So there's you can account for quantitative things like time, as in general relativity and special relativity. So that's there, right? That's the struct, as we call it, structural. But there's also the process. So you're right. It, 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 right. In becoming, you need two things. I wouldn't call them two times because time, physical time, meaning the what general activity calls physical time, that is, from the time on world lines, is there as a property of the causal set. But there is also becoming. But just to be sure, well, that's, that, but that's not time. That doesn't correspond but to time. But to me, it's the same thing, the becoming for physical reasons, or only for to make room for the possibility of the phenology? It, I can, so in the development of these models, the notion of becoming was a useful one, so that the, the models were discovered by, in, in this in the way that I described it, the idea was that causal set elements come into being, and there's a transition between you know, a five element causal set and a six element causal set, where a new, a new element is born. So that played a heuristic role in the development of physics. It may or may not be repeated as we try to, as we struggle to build a quantum theory. So it may it may be that we jump straight to a block, block type view of the world in, in quantum in, or a force two or something. That would be, I think, meaningful. But it may be that again that this year is coming will lead us towards the correct or a successful theory of quantum So for me these heuristics that you know that in a sense I don't think we can we can't resolve the question. It's it's simply that Thinking about things in different ways leads in different directions in, in, in physics research. For example, you know, the contrast between the Minkowski view of space time, in which space time is a four dimensional entity with a parent in you know, the, the particular geometry, right? or the, the Lorentzian view in which, in which you know, there's three dimensional space and physical objects really do contract you know, when they're moving. So there are different points of view, and but one turned out to be successful, right? So in in terms of leading towards generalism. So I don't think taking the Lorentz point, you know, the Lorentz theory, in which you have three-dimensional objects which really do shrink when they move, I don't think that would have led to generalism. But the the cosmic view, in which there is space time, it's a four-dimensional substance, it has this geometry that that opens the door to, to the development of generalisms. So I think that you know, this, being, this notion of becoming could play a similar heuristic role in leading to future successful physical or not. Okay, let's move back to Chicago, Nick. Yeah, but I wanted to talk about something you said on a slide in particular. Is it possible to put a slide back up? 
the one about asynchronous becoming, I don't know, about half a dozen or so slides back in. Thanks. Oops, lost it. Way before that, or half a dozen slides before that. Uh, they're not. Then way after that. I thought that was at the end, that one from Einstein. It says asynchronous becoming, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, and then it's in particular, okay. So it's the last, well, the second to last bullet point. Once an event has happened, i.e. the atoms that comprise the event have been born, those atoms are real, they form the part of the world we call the past. So maybe I don't quite fully understand what's going on, but that does not seem to me to make the past subjective because it refers to being born which is part of the object you know is an objective thing as you say below right so this doesn't make the past subjective it means right it seems to make it partly well it's ob it, it's in, at least in part objective because it depends on what has been born right but maybe you weren't claiming that the, the past was subject was sort of subjective no, the past is objective, but then what I mean by the first process is objective is that it carries on regardless of the past. I mean, maybe in that sense, the past is also objective, but, but for each, each space time atom, each space time atom has its own past. Right? So in that sense, it's, there isn't a past, there is you know, one for each. There's a path for each space time. So what I meant by saying the first process is objective is that it's, it doesn't depend on, on the existing that carries on. But the past isn't right. But the past is still okay. Is objective in the sense that there isn't a past until those atoms have actually been born. Right, the, the thing is that there's, there's so, a past, so, you know, there's a space that's coming to be so, so, that atom, there was, you know, there was the past. It's all the atoms that are in its, that are in its past. And for another atom, it's just, it's just a different collection of atoms. Right. That's what I mean by subjective. But the world that exists, to, yeah. So there is no world that exists. You can't say, oh, look, there's, you know, I'll draw it on a piece of paper there. Or I'll show it in a movie there. You know, here it is growing. That, you can't do that. That's the. So in that sense, it's, you know, the world that exists is the physical world is more. You know, the physical world that, com that is comprised of these atoms and their relations. It's not object. There isn't one. It's subject. Maybe I'm using the word objective and subjective in this way, but I must have the words to use. But whether the world, but whether some part of the world exists, so I'm thinking of the past as existing because it's a growing block. Whether some part of the world exists or not depends on whether it's been whether it's been born or not. And that's objective. Right, that's subjective. So then it's not a subjective whether the world exists. Because it depends on whether it's been born or not.
So I'm not sure, did you hear what he no, said? No, I'm sorry. Thank because you. I don't think I did. Oh, OK. So I'm trying to get my, I mean, I guess I'll just say what I said again. So whether something exists, whether a part of the block exists or not, depends on whether it's, and maybe I'm saying what's wrong with what I'm saying, it seems to depend on whether it's been born or not. And maybe it's that statement in particular kind of makes it sense. You know, once an event has happened, it, makes, it seems to make it contingent on whether it's been born or not. But maybe that's not what you mean somehow. It does depend on whether it's been born. And that's subjective. Whether it's been born yet or not depends on from, from whose perspective. So, you know, there's a space time, so a space time atom, you know, this space time atom. If those, the space time atoms we're referring to, then if they've been born, then as far as that, let's call the space time atom we're talking about A, right? So, as far as A is concerned, these space time atoms have been born because they're in its past. Yeah. Physical, but is, is that asked for that space time But it's subjective because it depends on, it, you know, it's on A. So maybe, can I suggest yeah. sort of a friendly amendment for then rewriting that second to last sort of bullet point? It's something more along the li lines of, you know, once an event has happened, you mean, i.e., sort of relative to that event, um, the atoms to the past are real, they form the part of the world we call the past. Well, I said that would kind of thing. So I could say, I could draw out the subjectivity of that statement that as far as, you know, so consider space time atom A in the process, you know, in the process of being born. As far as A is concerned, there are some space time atoms that have already been born. And those exist as far as A is concerned. And that's what we, and that's what we would call the past of A, let's say. Yeah. So I agree, I think that that's. Yeah, OK. I think I see what I was getting hooked up on. Um, but part of what's important here is nothing can be born in the past of A. You know, once, we, once A is, has happened, there aren't going to be any more events in the past of A. Sure. Yeah. Is that, yeah. that's yeah, correct? It goes into the future, yes. Yeah. So all of its past has to be there. I'm not relying on there's A and the things its past that's been born so far. Once A is there, there's not, not going to be anything new in its past. Yeah. Correct, correct, correct. Yes. Can I just... Yeah. That's a point. Yeah. I should write this down. So, so it, so, so, well, we recorded it, so you can just watch it, I guess. So is, so is the room... <laughs> sorry. There Peter is, wants to follow up. Uh, so, is there, so I was just... To clarify what Nick said, so is there a rule saying that once a specific event has happened, there will never happen yeah, a new event in the it past? Can it can't in be in the past light cone of that event, yes. roughly, right? Or, or the past, causal past of that? A specific rule like that. I okay. think you might have to call it internal temporality or something. Okay. Or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that clarifies. But, yeah. Okay, that's all. Um, thank you for the talk. I have a general question about if we could say something about the quantum evolution of this. But before that, um, the idea about the, the God's eye view, I was wondering whether the perspective from the end of time would be, would be something like the, the God, God's eye view in this, in this picture, if there is an end of time. Also, within causal set theory, or 
Well, if you, so let's say we could model a cosmology in which there is an end of time within these sequential growth models. So you, you're contrasting what I consider to be different models. One is that you just run the process and you find that there's an end. But then in fact, classical sequential growth models can't end for anywhere because that's supposed to be good. Then you run it to the end and you, and you just have this block. You say, that's my universe. And we happen to be right in the middle of it right now. But your world picture is this block. Contrast that to the growing block. Right? So I, I, at the moment, am on, you know, on, what I'm experiencing is the birth of all these space time atoms that comprise my brain, the events of my brain. Like and, I'm, and the future doesn't exist. So I'm, it's, it's a dynamic picture of the world. It's not, we're, not we're in it. We're in it. We're in it. We're in it. We're right we're in it. Yeah. It's dynamic and we're in it. That's the, you can't step outside it. You're in it. So, that, to me, that's a different, it's a different theory. You might say, oh, well, they're empirically equivalent. But my example with the Lorentz theory and the Minkowski theory of Electromagnetic phenomena in relativity shows, I think, that even if two, two theories are empirically different, they can lead in different directions. One could be fruitful, one could be, you know, one could be lead nowhere. So that, that's the reason I think that it's important to, to have to keep in bear in mind different points of view, even if they're, like, if they're you know, thus far empirically, one may be fruitful. Different ways to be my group. I Of, of 
a physical world, a physical quantum world that is possible, that grows step by step. So that there's no relativity, there's no no, no asynchronous becoming in that in that role that they you know can try to develop the notion of what's real in a passage or what's physical. What's physical in a quantum 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 Thank you. Um, so you said that we need the dynamics in order to um, recover DR as approximated by the solutions to the ice time fluid equations. I'm just um, hoping you could elaborate a bit on that, please, because I kind of imagine that we want the dynamics as a way of um, picking out the space time um, by actually producing it. Um, so you know, a way of explaining the space time, which is what we want one to do. But I guess I'm not seeing how or why we necessarily need dynamics in order to do that. Um, why not just some sort of rule that helps us pick out from these kinematical mm -hmm. models which ones the correct yes. Right. yes, yeah, right. So, yes, that is entirely open, and that's entirely a possibility that you, know, you have a big bag of causal sets. Infinite causal sets, which corresponds to you know, to, to block, you know, block universe views of the world, and you've got this big bag in them, and you have some way of, of you know, picking up somehow picking up typical ones from those, and then you look at them and you find that they are you know, they're, they're well approximated by solutions in yes, the Yes, it absolutely we go just rule that as yeah. The question is how to find that book. <laughs> so the idea of Growth models is that it was too hard to just posit a rule for infinite causal sets that was interesting and fruitful and you know, had, was, you know, uh, had nice properties. So instead, they used this idea that we should build up this, this, um, this way of choosing the causal sets. I actually grew up Yes, by growing. Yeah, exactly. So, but it's, yeah, if one can be clever enough to actually come up with something which will, which will deal with the infinite causal sets, these blocks, you know, all at once, and we have the geometry. Sure, it's just I think they had absolutely no idea how to do that. Growing them was was a way to. Problems. There's various problems with 
the hypothesis that space must fundamentally continue, meaning that it's not a bidirectional manifold. Yes, we can. But the, the, whether or not those problems go away when you posit fundamental discreteness is an open question. Mm -hmm. That's a whole question for the best. Wrapped up in the question of quantum gravity. It's just it's also exactly the question. Because my question was, well, is there a premium on discreteness? Because if you take, uh, uh, say, the uh, set of the point of the range in rational coordinates is it's not continuous. It's not continuous. It's also by the wrong discrete. You, you can, you know, and you can. Yes, it's not discrete in the sense that the causal set is discrete. Exactly. <laughs> So the question is, is there really a premium on we must find that something really discrete in which you have, which is like not dense, or which you really yes. can't in a region, yes. something like that, no. or we just want to make something like rational and sufficient? So causal set theory is found on the on the on the belief, I suppose, or the strong <laughs> Suspicion that there is a real premium on it being not just not continuous, but um, locally finite. So that in in a region of space time which has finite space time volume, there are finite many space time atoms. And the reason for that is that it's the way that you're going to recover the information, the geometrical information that's missing from the causal order. So that theorem, the Penrose from the forming Malcolm theorem, it says that if you just know the causal order, you don't know everything about the judge. You know almost everything, but you're missing one thing. You're missing information about how much space time you have in every region. But when you go discrete, you get and, and look at the finite, you get that information free because so you have a counting measure. So you can just count. And if you have rationals, that's lost. So, yeah, so the, the specifically for causal sets, it's crucial that it's not discrete in the rational sense, but it's discrete in that sense. It would be fine, that sense. Yeah. I have one more question. You said towards the end, one or twice, that there's something novel, a novel notion of becoming that uh, has been identified here. And I take it that means, in particular, a notion or a sense of uh, becoming asynchronous as it may be, that is not available in general relativity. Uh, so, presume, I mean, that's the, if, if that's the intended meaning, then I would, I, I'm not sure I completely see how it's so different from the notion of worldline becoming that one could, in, could introduce in, in GR as well. It would be a continuous space time, of course, but you can have uh, all these world lines and in a way become asynchronous becoming uh, with no objective fact about whether you know, the, the world line up here has grown before that one has in a way. So in a way it wouldn't really make sense to even have a discrete uh, order of course of these things. But there could be something like world line becoming that would be a reasonably close Continuing analog to to the classic sequential growth dynamics here um, that yeah. seems perfectly right. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know enough about what I'm becoming to to um, say too much, but yes, I even you could even just dispense with the world lines and just say that the points of a Lorentzian space time are born in a partial order. And the partial order is just the partial order that they that they have as being part of the Lorentzian space. It, it, to, so to the extent that you can conceive of that, then I think you could have a synchronous becoming and becoming and continuing. Personally, it's just much more difficult to to yeah to wrap my head around, I mean it's hard enough to wrap my head around asynchronous becoming a discrete space time atom to, to wrap it around like, yeah, an asynchronous becoming of a continuum and, you know, and it's very very, there are a lot of points <laughs> <laughs> you can't be an asynchronous um, but yeah, so you can see, I think 
to be accepted that you can conceive of that. If you just say the words, I'm not happy with that then. I don't see that you can't conceive of that. Will I become God and then clear? Because there's any point where you're infinitely many worlds. Sure, so yeah, so that's God. And that's an infinity that's even beyond the asynchronous becoming. If you just attach the term asynchronous becoming to, you know, to, to a continuous space time without the world lines, that's already a large number of things that have to become. But if you've got one becoming for every world, so each space time point is not a, is associated to infinite many world lines. Are we coming for each of those worlds? Uh, I think I just don't know enough about it, so I don't know what that is. I, I'm not sure, I recall the details of it. So, um, uh, Ron Clifton and Mark Hogarth about 20 years ago were doing five almost. By now, in the articles, it has now proposed a pretty elaborate and worked out theory of the um, world I'm becoming. And the idea is that the world line is a natural thing to take as sort of a primary thing of having observers or physical objects in a space time. And if you relativize the notion of becoming, you forget about an objective global God's eye kind of becoming, yeah. but you relativize it to, to observers which move along world lines, then you can have a perfectly uh, Lawrence and Mary relativist the kosher sense of becoming. They did not use the word uh, asynchronous becoming, of course, because I think that's rough on this yeah. term, but... Um, yeah, it seems very spiritually good. <clears throat> yeah, anyway, I think we've reached the end of time. Uh, so please join me in thanking Clay again. <laughs>